going on? This is the Divine Prospect Kenny Harvard's Ministries. I'm here with a special guest, a two-time award winner. <laughs> Only Love Austin, and that's her real name. All right. Now, some of you may know her because um, I had given Prophetic Whirlwind, which is her Instagram page, and her name a shout out when I shared one of her videos when you went to go see the Sefwi peoples at the House of Israel, right? Yes, yes. Um, and I had uh, used that in one of my lectures last year, and I told people if they wanted more information on that, that they can go to your channel and check you out. So, um, Only Love, please give us your um, experience in regards to your travels to West Africa. Let us know the routes that you went. Uh, if you can remember the places that you went, the tribe that you've seen, and first-hand account from them, because I've seen your videos, mm -hmm. but I want to hear from you on what they share with you in regards to our identity. So, um, Shalom family, thank you for having me, Divine, and thank you for the shout-out, and that was a good video on kind of the West African Hebrews being a time capsule. So, um, I have been to Ghana three times. The last time I actually lived there for a couple of months. Nigeria to Lagos, Abuja, and all the states in Ebo land except wow. for one. Twice. So and you was in a number state? A number state, a Nugu, uh -huh. um, Edo state. E um, Emo state. Uh -huh. I love Emo. I love everybody, but I love <laughs> Emo, Abia state. Wow. Everywhere except for Ebony, which uh -huh. I want to get to. Um, and I also went to Togo, um, tried to go to Benin, customs wouldn't let us in, and Togo got a lot of spiritual stuff going on, so yeah. you ain't, if you ain't allowed in Togo, don't you sneak <laughs> don't in Togo, don't force yourself in don't there, yeah. Y'all <laughs> don't need for you to be there. Um, I've also been to Morocco, but before that I actually went to Israel, I was invited by Mahalia Goodman, mm -hmm. who was one of the first people to go with the African and Hebrew Israelites of Demona. Uh -huh. um, so I went there first and wow. then went to West Africa. Wow. So when I went, um, one thing I noticed is that I've been to Hebrew, awakened Hebrew congregations in Africa. I've met with um, royals from Hebrew tribes. One thing I noticed is the people embedded in their culture is Torah, is the Levitical law. I also also was invited by Elder Cletus Okoro from the House of Israel, Nigeria, to teach the women mm -hmm. about the Ashet Hayel, the Ezra Kenegdo. And what I noticed is, you know, among the Igbo, they have these associations that are in each village that handle the community issues, the economic issues, but they also have the women's associations and the men's. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the women's association, the, the men don't know, and what yep. happens in the men's, the women don't know, but no one's threatened by that mm -hmm. because it's balanced. Yes. And if someone has a need, that association meets the need. Uh -huh. And so another thing I, I experienced is the first time I went to Ghana, the supreme king of the Ashanti people, his mother died, the queen oh. mother died, wow. and everything shut down. Yeah. Ashanti people came from all over the world, and one of the king's cousins heard my group talking at our table over dinner and he said where are y'all from because he heard African American and Caribbean accents so we told him and he started talking to us he apologized for slavery he started crying he said "You, some of you could be my family and then he took off his royal sandals wow. and gave them to an elder from Jamaica wow. and he also I said where did the Ashanti migrate from he said oh Israel and Mesopotamia just like it wasn't a religious <laughs> it, answer it's just like I don't even even think he goes to church or anyone's yeah, synagogue yeah. it was just this is a fact you know mm -hmm. you know of in um, then when I returned a year later, they had the celebration of life or the funeral mm -hmm. for the Queen Mother. It mm -hmm. took a year of searching for the Queen Mother mm -hmm. because you have to be a woman in menopause and you have to be a woman of good report. Now, they shut down Kumasi, the, the, um, the head of the Ashanti Kingdom, to the point where if you opened your business, during her funeral week, the police would shut you down. Wow. Someone I know tried to open their business and that happened. Us. They had dignitaries from all over the world, including you, including Europeans, paying homage to this woman. Mm. Now, we may say, well, Israel never had queen mothers, but that's not true. 
It's actually called Samara, and it's in Torah. It's in Kings. It's in other books. Um, when Solomon, Bathsheba comes to Solomon, he says, "Get a chair, put it at my right side for her to sit." She was a queen mother. When they're taking the captives to Babylon, a queen mother is recorded being taken. A queen mother is just someone who gives birth to the king. And in Ashanti culture, we get it mixed up. We say, "Well, they're mat they're a matriarchal society. They're not matriarchal. Women don't rule." They're matrilineal, meaning you trace the descent. Say that again, because people so, don't know so the difference. So matriarchal is when women rule and dominate, but matrilineal is just they're tracing who the king is through the, through mother. the mother. There you That's go. all it means. But exactly. the Ashanti men are still patriarchs. They're still strong. But what I noticed is they had that balance. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the Ashanti kingdom, I was able to meet more than once the the chief that is second to the supreme Ashanti king. Wow. Was able to meet the queen mothers. But um, one day, um, there's a, a bar across the street from the palace where the Ashanti royals and queen mothers hang out. A queen mother owns it. So we wasn't getting drunk out there now, family. Some of my family that pray for me, they'll be like, oh, prophetic or no. We weren't getting drunk. I had, you know, my little soda. But um, I was I was just sat at a table by my friend of, of all these Ashanti chiefs. They weren't dressed in attire. They just looked like regular, you know, brothers. And then I found out they were chiefs. So wow. they don't know that I'm there to do research for yeah, my book, yeah. Prophetic World When Uncovering the Black Biblical Destiny, which is available now. They didn't know that. I'm sitting and one chief looks at me, and this is a true story. Now, I couldn't get out my phone and record because this is a natural conversation. He looks at me and he has tears in his eyes and he says, you know, we're not from here. I said, I know you're not from here, sir. He said, we're from Israel. And then he looked at me again and he was crying. He said, you know, you guys are not from America, right? I said, I know. He said, y'all are from Israel too. And he said, I just don't know why God put us in this. And he literally was crying. And then I shared with him while I was there. And he said, wow, I need to talk to you. And this was a table of, of chiefs. And so also I visited um, Ezi Eri of the Evo people. Okay, wait, because oh, that's that's the highlight. Yes. So I'm going to take a slow time before I get yes. there. So wait, so what I want to interject was I watched Rebirth's Passover. Mm -hmm. And they had a brother yeah, from, and he, he gave a shout out to you. Now that brother said that he originally grew up in he Ghana and then he moved to New York. Yeah. And then he went to school in New York, right? New York and Ghana. And Ghana. And then what he did with this presentation was talking about the cultural similarities between the Ashanti and the ancient Israelites, yeah. right? All right. So um, what I wanted to say in regards to that is a lot of information that he was sharing. He said that his encounters with you helped him to connect the dots. Can you talk on that real quick because of your experience when you were there in Ghana and then we want to transition to the Igbo. Uh -huh. So this is the difference. So that's Gilbert. We actually went to the same seminary and connected. I didn't even know he said it helped him connect the dots. So wow, well, praise to y'all. So this is the thing about Hebrews in Africa. There are millions of Hebrews in Africa. Not everyone, it's not a religion, it's a culture. You do have a remnant that goes to Torah keeping assemblies, whether Messianic Torah only. But then you have many who may know from their grandparents that they descend from the Israelites, but they're going to Catholic church, they're Muslim. Yeah. They're nothing, but it, it because for them is their is like their ethnic identity. For us, we've made it more of a religion, and I think both sides. Proverbs says a righteous man avoids all extremes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do need to worship Yah in spirit and in truth, but this is a bloodline as well, uh -huh. and that is what you know they can help us understand. Exactly. Because sometimes we're making this another religious kind of thing, and yes. Yes, praying and worshiping and returning to Yah and repenting to Yah is important, but you also have to understand this is your bloodline. Exactly. So even your family member who's going to church, they still have a Hebrew bloodline. Uh -huh. You still need to try to reach them. Exactly. So um, many times with Hebrews in Africa, because I've also worked with Hebrews all over Africa, they um, are keeping the Torah, but they may not even know 
that they're keeping the what they can find in the Old Testament of their Bibles. Um, and there's a lot to unpack because there's a lot to unpack because you know Israel was put out of the land because mm -hmm. we fell into idolatry mm -hmm. and a lot of times we say well all the idolatry happened in Africa that's not true we had already fallen and remember Israel was physically connected to Africa until the Suez Canal was built so I always say we migrated further across the continent there you go. so there was already idolatry mixed with Torah and then there are just some things that are traditions that are not idolatry like if you and your family pray every Wednesday night to Yah. That's not idolatry. That just may be your family tradition. So what happened is there's customs that are Torah. There's customs that are Torah and idolatrous practices mixed together. And then there are customs that just cultural that developed over time that are not idolatry, but it's just adaptation exactly. because they're in a different environment. There you go. You know, and so we have to have a lot of discernment. And this is why I mix everything that I do humbly with prayer and other people praying for me to know what is you know what is fully returning what is mixing mm -hmm. Torah with idolatry because mm -hmm. we don't want to repeat the sins of our ancestors and then what is just a custom mm -hmm. you know and um, sometimes like we think bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah were made by um, Ashkenazi Jews but I actually learned on a, an Afrocentric podcast from a non-religious person and I was like, why is he talking about this? That bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs were actually created in West Africa so the Hebrew people can make sure their kids continued in the faith. It's a rites of passage. Yeah, it's just a rites of passage for boys and girls 13 and 14 to learn Torah, to publicly commit to following Torah mm -hmm. so that you don't lose the culture. And then they take on the responsibility Of an adult, yes. There you go. So, and so one thing I noticed mm -hmm. is, one, in the Hebrew congregations in Africa, the people worship and they value prayer. Mm -hmm. Many of the, the Igbos, when they pray, they prostrate all the way on the ground. Mm -hmm. We attribute that to Muslim brothers and sisters, but actually that's a Hebraic form it's of prayer. Yeah. They have all night prayer. The brothers are there just as much as the women. Mm -hmm. um, they really take worship seriously. Um, Ronald Dalton included a clip that I took of Igbos in a um, Sabbath service, they sung some songs uh -huh. to welcome me, and it sounded just like our gospel music. I said, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I that? said, wow, I, we got, we must have gotten that from you all. Yeah. Also, what I, um, my encounter with Ezzy Airy. Now, wait, wait, okay. wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, because that's the good part. Yeah. All right, so we're going to get there in one second. Okay. So you went to all the states that you had mentioned, except for the Ebony State, yes. right? So, um... My personal studies I like to engage in and friends that I know on the other side of the ocean who are in Igbo land that I speak with, um, what I was trying to do is to ascertain the difference between the tribes and which ones are the vanguards of the actual history of the migration of them being from Israel. So through my studies, I narrowed it down to the Arutupu people and, was at and the Enri people, right? Mm -hmm. So what I want you to do is if you can speak on both of those, because you mentioned that, um, I think, when you were sitting on yes, the panel. Yes. Those are the tribes. Now, the other ones are great. I just want your yes, information yeah. on those so tribes. So my Evo family, I'm not making a difference. That's Ron, Divine Prospect. Hit him up. Hit my inbox. My yeah, own. right? What's up with yeah. me full? Like, you don't care about Emo <laughs> No, we love Emo yeah. Okay, let's start with the Aruchuku. <laughs> so Aruchuku is Good. where Elder Cletus Okoro is from. Okay. Now, Aruchuku is very special because that is where most of the Evos who were sold into transatlantic slavery come from. Now, it comes from that oracle. <laughs> Yes. That was up there. Y'all correct me if I'm mistaken. And they're like I, I, the priests of before. the Igbo people. Correct. Very strict on that Torah. Yes. You break, they still keep the Sabbath. If you broke the Sabbath, you couldn't come to the festivals. That drink in Leviticus, if a sister was accused of adultery, Cletus is in his 40s. He grew up seeing sisters who were accused of adultery mm. with big stomachs, big thighs, because they drunk. The, this is in Leviticus, mm. where you take your wife to the priest. Mm -hmm. They burn some paper. They put it in a drink. She drinks it. Mm -hmm. If her stomach blows up, she's guilty of adultery. Yeah. If not, she's um, you know not put away. People think that was oppressive to women, but what that did was protect sisters from being falsely accused exactly. of adultery. Exactly. But some sisters got caught out there, and Elder Cletus would see them. Also, the Ashanti would do that. Yeah. And if you're of a certain age, you grew up 
seeing that sister. So I went to Aratuku. Uh -huh. That's where most of the Igbos were so were from who were sold into slavery. And the, the Bada Bafra, the yes. Bada Bani. And yeah. so when I was dropped when they were driving me in the village, I had fallen asleep because I was jet lagged and Claytus woke me up, woke me up. I'm like, why is he waking me up? Um and he said, Only love, we're driving over the bridge where they took the Igbos out of Igbo land. Wow. Then um he we were um driving through the village and he said let's get out of the car and walk so i'm walking i'm walking down this beautiful red clay road and i start to feel a sadness come over me even though i was happy i was in nigeria happy i wasn't working but this sadness came over me and i said i want to cry and then his el his elder uncle invited me in the house and started talking. He said, that's where they would march the enslaved people out of Igbo land. And I realized I was feeling the pain of our ancestors at that moment. And then um, that whole town had a welcome ceremony for me. The wow. town within Arachuku, the Eze came, uh -huh. they had a welcome for me, and Claytus and his wife gave me this beautiful Igbo attire. Wow. And an outfit was made. And so Platus took me on the bridge and said, let's get out and take a picture. And I was in full traditional attire standing on that bridge. And my family, the Alstons, were owned, they, were, they were owned by one of the largest slaveholding families in American history. There's a documentary and book called The Alston Family Name. Wow. And there's about to be another documentary made from the black side of the Alstons about even how we migrated and some of us ended up in Nigeria. Wow. And our migration route goes line in line with the Hebrew history. That's crazy. And the family member who's doing it, he's into Kemet. He's not even Hebrew. So <laughs> yeah. you know what to say only It's love. bias, I'm, right? I'm no yeah, nowhere right? involved in this documentary. <laughs> I'm just a family member. I stood on that bridge in that attire. And I said, you know what? My family may have left enslaved, but I'm returning a free woman in y'all. And I really felt like something broke for my family. So wow. even though I was there to learn for the book, I think something spiritual happened. When I was walking through the village, people were coming out of their homes mm. because they, their ancestors were told you would never see those people again. Wow. So when I returned and knowing that some of my family tested with Nigeria in their mm -hmm. blood, the villagers it was almost like their ancestors were seeing were seeing me again. Wow, that's crazy. So transition from Aru mm -hmm. and well actually did you speak to them about any of their migration stories or mm -hmm. um, them saying that they're from the lost tribes or anything like oh, that because yeah. it's a it's a widely held belief that the Uru Tufu is one of the vanguards of the Igbo Israel history. Mm -hmm. Did you have any encounters with them or their chiefs or anything like yeah. that in regards to that information? So not with the, I didn't get to talk to the Eze about that but the elder who was a journal, I mean it was almost second knowledge. Yeah. Even even for the people that went to the local Pentecostal church, in um, yeah, even for the people who were still in a church or the people who weren't religious, it was almost like second knowledge. All right, keep going. So okay. one thing about it is, even for the non-religious people, it was second knowledge. We know we're from Israel. Uh -huh. Now, where I got the confirmation from the royal and heard more about the migration route was when we went to Obugad in Anambra State. Uh -huh. And I met with Ezi Airy and his people. He has a Hebrew congregation on his compound. That, so Ezi Airy, um, that's a title. Yes, that's Ezi given to is the ruler. a title. Uh -huh. And um, the Ezi of Obugad, all of the Ezis go back to Airy, uh -huh. who is one of the sons of, of Gad. Gad. Yep. Like we, we, we like to say that, oh, all of Gad went one place, all of Nephitali went one place. But each case had multiple sons and daughters Bad. and the people may have ended up in different places. So I don't say one group is Gad. Exactly. I don't do that. I don't say one group is Judah. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. So when I went to, um, I went to Ez meet Ezi Airy twice. He has a heart for our people. Next weekend he will be in Virginia wow. in Ebo Village. He comes every year to wow. do a festival with African Americans. Wow. And he is a man of strong faith. That's beautiful. Wait, when is that? That is next Next weekend, Damn. Friday to Sunday. I would love to be there. It happens man. every year. 
he even appointed a woman from Flatbush, Brooklyn as princess wow. and a brother from Texas as a king. Wow. So when I went, he took me to the throne room. He has an ancient throne. They do talk about their migration route and when they got to Obugad, they planted a tree. So um, in the scriptures, when Yah would have an encounter with his people, they may do, um, like they may put up stones to uh, memorialize uh, or something, yeah. When Yah answers your prayers, you may write it in a gratitude journal. Do something to mark what Yah has done in your life. So they planted a tree, and also Benai Ephraim of Senegal, the Hebrews of Senegal, when they got to Senegal, they planted a tree as well. Uh -huh. And you can't go near the tree unless you get approval. Exactly. If you're a sister on your cycle, you can't go. Um, and so I met with him in the throne room. He has a prayer. He's a man of strong, strong faith. Um, he ha he believes in the scriptures. He um, lays hands on African Americans heads and he prays for the curse of slavery on our mind to be broken wow. and he's going to do that next week That's incredible. so the first time I went I didn't get the prayer and I was shy to ask the second time I went, I said, I'm not leaving. If you know, I, like, Jake, I'm <laughs> not leaving until right? you bless me. Yeah, I said, yeah, I need yeah. this prayer. So I was like, um, as the airy, you know, can I, I, you know, I said, can I get the prayer? And, you know, they were, they're very hospitable. So they yeah. were giving me drinks and food, and I wasn't eating or drinking. And as he's like, eat, so eat, only <laughs> love. We're going to pray for yeah. you. Drink your water. So they took me in the throne room. And he laid hands on me and prayed for me. And this is very humbling. I don't always share this. And everyone started to praise Rabbi Garbello Guga, um, Elder Cletus Okoro, all the king's men. And one of his, and the king said, open the Bible and read the scripture wherever it fell, falls. And when I opened the Bible, we got to Zephaniah. And I think it was Zephaniah 610, but it was a scripture about... Um, the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim, mm -hmm. the northern and the southern kingdom, coming back together again. And this is excellent, man. This is really good. So the second thing I want to say is, have you heard of ISSAJ before? The International Society yes. for the Study of African yes, Jewry? Yes, I have, and I'm trying to go to one of their conferences. Okay, excellent. And what they were doing was investigating the claims of Africans who say that they have Israelite heritage, right? And uh, the paper that I wrote up on it uh, that I want to submit when I'm ready to go to the conference, because uh, I want I need to get it peer-reviewed and everything before I do, um, goes to say that their perspective and how they identify who a Jew is is not relational to the core Torah practices that they have. So the question, so the point I'm trying to make with that, when they actually analyze it from a root surface, is that if these people say that they're from the northern tribes, most of them come from the northern tribes, number one. Number two, they would not be familiar with second temple practices yes. that they will only <laughs> learn over time, right? Yes. Or, or other yes. subsequent migrations. Yes. Um, and then also, importantly, is to understand that what today people say is a Jew is based on their matrilineal uh, uh, heritage from the uh, from their Talmudic practices and also from the halakha that they practice. So when they go into these regions already with this predetermined understanding of what a Jew is supposed to be, and then they go back and they look at these West Africans and say, oh, they're not really Jews because they're just adopting it because of the internet or yeah, because they wrestle or because, or because of the Ba'afra that occurred in Igbo yeah. land. But what the, well, something that you said was very important where you say that a lot of them, they don't act like they're like Jews. They do their regular customs. And what she labels them is called Hebrewists. So the Hebrewists are the West Africans that say, oh yeah, we came from Israel, you know, and we have Israelite heritage. But when you see them, they're not the ones really in the temples or the synagogues that have the Talit yeah. that's praying. They're just doing their regular cousin practices and they identify that it is Torah based. So from your experience there, from the ones who are in the temple in the synagogue that's praying, that's doing their prayers, and then the ones that are outside that also identify as migrating for Israel, what would you say is the stark difference between the two groups? So one thing I want to say is a lot of, one thing, I want to say a couple of things. A lot of our family in the West see 
Igbos, especially in other Hebrews in Africa, and many of them call themselves Jews because in Africa, all Jews are black. So we don't have to say, oh, they're a Jew, I'm a Hebrew. It's like everybody's black. So it's like, the, you know, uh -huh. we see them in their temples and we say, oh, they're doing white Jewish practices. But some of the things, even, you know, the um, some of the things we're attributing to European Jews were created by us, even in Babylon, even in the first century. So that's a certain thing. If we don't want to do those things, we should just say they're not good things to do. But we give too much credit to others. That's number one. Number two, not everyone is... So Elder Cletus Okoro is a part of Yahweh Covenant Assembly, which was started by an Igbo, a Yoruba, and a Hausa. If wow. you know anything How about tribalism <laughs> in Nigeria, you know that, that was a sounds impossible. of y'all. <laughs> they started a network of about 60 messianic synagogues throughout wow. Nigeria, never funded by white Jews. Wow. No white Jews came to help them. See, some people totally think, black -led. Some people think that's the white Jews that's no, funding this. No, this was totally... I met the first lady of the founder who just recently passed away, Madam Joseph. Know her, know her family. Everyone was black. Wow. We cannot just look at them wearing a kippah and yeah. a tie and say, white Jews did that. Our people have agency and our people can make their own decisions. Let's stop giving away... If, even if you don't agree with some of the customs, you need to inquire. Did you, you come? Go. Just ask them because they might say, no, my grandma told me yeah. to do this. So that's number one. Number two, the Evos had this DNA controversy mm -hmm. by Jewish Voice Ministries. Uh -huh. I actually keynoted a conference with the second in command at Jewish Voice Ministries. He heard me put, um, present and didn't knock anything I said, but... Their DNA company was only about a year old when they tested the Evo. Oh. What you have to understand about DNA companies is they get more accurate the, many, the more years they exist because they get more samples. Sample sizes, yep. They were, you know, they did not have a strong enough DNA company to do that, number one. Number two, when the Limbo were tested, they were tested not by a Jewish DNA company, but by an Oxford-educated geneticist oh. who was an Indian woman who had no skin in the game. Wow. When you watch their Discovery Channel yeah. documentary, it's an Indian woman. She's probably Hindu, has no skin, even though wow. there are Hebrews in India. Yeah. She has no skin in the game. So we got to be careful with these reports. Now, when you look at the people in the Hebrew congregations versus the Hebrews that may be in their villages, yeah. just keeping the customs, uh -huh. maybe in churches, uh -huh. and know who they are is, I think, between the two. The ones outside of the temple may have more um, practices that are outside of the Bible that's mixed with what they're doing. Um, also, is they're awakening like us. So there's always a remnant that are going to organize Hebrew communities and want to meet regularly. And this is an awakening process for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you can learn from, but I learned from the royals. I mm -hmm. learned from, from, the, common from, folk. from yep. the common people that go to Sabbath every week. And they and, call them the Sabbatarians. Yes. Some people say they're messianic and they call them, this is And, and there's also Torah, what we would call Torah only that they yeah. call Orthodox And they don't well. deal with the messianic yeah. aspect either. And I say this because because these are terms that the organization uses to identify various groups in West Africa that make the claims to have an Israelite heritage. And this is heritage. not how the people identify themselves. Exactly. Like and, they that's, don't, and that's, a, that's so the big disconnect. We, I here. have to use Messianic and Torah only for you all to understand. Yeah. But the Hebrews in Africa that believe in Yahshua and the ones that don't, don't call themselves Torah only and Messianic, <laughs> they just may say, you know, we have a, you know, we're, we believe in Messiah and they're Orthodox. Or, yeah. And it, Orthodox doesn't mean like white Jewish Orthodox. Exactly. So these are, we have have to be mindful so I'm aware of the society and I'm, I'm planning on going to the conference one day yeah. but one thing that happens is you know no matter how many Torah customs exist in these people's indigenous cultures like the women staying inside after pregnancy Nida yep. is very serious very serious the naming ceremony the naming circumcision ceremony. Sabbath in Ghana before colonialism, Sabbath was no joke. Uh -huh. Like you're like among the Sefi, I love the Sefi people. They're very sweet, 
but back in the day, you could be, um, I say, excused to be with y'all yeah. until the resurrection uh -huh. if you broke Sabbath. Uh -huh. It was that serious. Yeah. But also, if you molested a child, yeah. you were put out of the village. Yep. Yep. You know, it was. A, and one thing I learned from the Hebrews in Africa is you, if you're calling yourself this, then you have to live the life. And um, it's nothing wrong with worshiping Yah. That's uh -huh. what our people do. Yeah. You know, we don't just sit and read about Yah, but we, we worship Him with our whole being. And I think with um, the African Hebrew people, they're really um, starting to connect with us now. The young people, I would say 30 and under, that are awakened, they watch all of our teachers online. That's what I heard. I met two young Igbo <laughs> boys. When I say they knew the name of every camp wow. and teachers, and they said, we love what y'all are doing. When we come through, when we, when we made contact with the Ugandan Jews, they messaged me back and they said, wow, we didn't even know that you all knew we existed. Mm. And the two young Igbo men told me, we watch all of you, but how come you can't all come together? And I didn't know how to answer that question. Wow. But it's like, I didn't know you all were looking for us to come together. One of the <laughs> stuff we elders yeah. took me aside. And with tears in his eyes, he said, we need the African-American. Yeah, and we do because, like I tell people, we have intellectual property, they have cultural property. Yes. And yes. if we can exchange that in an environment where there's no hatred, no bitterness, yes. you know, anything like that, how great we've become. So let me, let me wrap it up with you and actually this last thing. So the reason why I brought that out is because there's a lot of organizations that are investigating this phenomenon and trying to discredit it because the way they categorize it yes. is not indigenously the way that people see it but it's from almost like an academic study that they're doing on these people and trying to say that they're not authentic because how is it possible that they're able to keep these customs and these lineage like for example the house of israel mm -hmm. this is from the sefwi tribe they trace that back to a vision that was given and they say you see that right there, this is and why I'm, they're I'm not authentic. I'm going to break that all the way down from the, their elders. So, remember how we wake up in America, the family in Africa wake up. The Seth, we migrated from Israel, stopped in Ivory Coast, um, Mali, different places, ended up in Ghana. Now, they were practicing Torah. They were farming like Torah, keeping the Sabbath. Then colonialism and slavery came. Many of them got converted to Christianity, lost their way. And then in the 70s, um, Mr. Aaron, their founder, mm -hmm. was praying. And Yah's Ruach told him, you are Hebrews. Return your people to Torah. Mm -hmm. And he went and preached on the streets mm -hmm. like our brothers do. Mm -hmm. Not the same tactic, but he <laughs> yeah. preached on the street. Uh -huh. And he said, we have to return to Torah. Wow. That does not mean that they just started keeping Torah in the 70s. Exactly. It means that there was they were keeping Torah, there was a break, there and then they go. picked it up again. Exactly. And um and that elder said from the Seth we said we need you all African Americans to tell our story and keep our history. Oh man, that's beautiful. The, and um and the you know this is something that many um, white scholars will just say see it's only from the 70s but when the Seth we elders speak in the documentary Doing Jewish, a story uh -huh. from Ghana. They try to just debunk no, that but too. The, but the elders actually that are not, re they're not going to the Sefwi Hebrew temples uh -huh. and towns. Uh -huh. They're not a part of the Sefwi branch of the African Hebrew uh -huh. Israelites of Demona. The elders are doing their own thing. Yep. And they say, no, we did migrate. Yeah. We are from Israel. <laughs> and I like talking to people who they're not you know they don't they don't the elders are not going to the hebrew assembly. like there's no incentive there's for them no to say what they're saying the history and i met um the supreme chief of the sefwi the uh -huh. new supreme chief uh -huh. you know to build those those connections but the sefwi elder he said explicitly we need the african americans to record our history so and here's the story. last question mm -hmm. the enri peoples the priestly class of the enri peoples that are there so there's a uh, if you go back and look, and, and I'm not sure how much you know about this, but I'm going to share it to get your final insights on it. When you go back and look at the two competing theories, right? There's three major theories in regards to the Igbo forming where they are today. The first one is that they were aboriginal to that region yeah. based on archaeological finds. That's number uh -huh. one. The second one is they developed in Lakoja 
um, and this is done through linguistic analysis to say that the Yoruba peoples, all the Igbo peoples there originally was at the Benue, Niger, Confluence region, and then after some point in time, they branched out and went south into the region they are currently. And then the last one is that they had a migration from the east, which they were telling the colonialists that came there before they was indoctrinated with Christianity. So the reason why I bring this up to you is because when you look at the Enri tribe, the Enri and the Aruchuku peoples are the ones that were identified by other tribes that they came from the east and they brought a lot of their customs, their traditions, even their worship of one chief deity, Chuku, into that region. That's what the Aru Chuku were known for, hence why you have the name Chuku with Aru, yeah. My, my name so, my father, yeah. so then my question for you, last question for you is that if you haven't seen the Enri, have you met any of the priests from the common folk or the ones that work with the chiefs that also give an account for their migration from the east? Any priestly class amongst them? So, um, in Aratuku, there are many priests, and I believe Elder Cletus family is a part of that priestly class. So, one thing that's happening with the Igbos, there's a lot of things that are happening, and I think an Igbo person could speak on this, but some of the migration stories or the myths are actually borrow borrowing from other tribes. Some Hebrews in Africa don't want to identify as Hebrew or Jew, or Jew because they don't want to be seen as hating their African culture and wanting to be white. Exactly. Because there, is, there are some of us, even in America, that are embracing the Hebrew heritage so we can back away from Africa, from being African, from our features, and from our history. Problem. And that's why I named my book Black Biblical Destiny. If you're trying to use this Hebrew thing to run away from being black, I'm not about it. There I'm you not go. for it. There you because go. Israel was physically connected to Africa. Yes. We spent thousands of years there. We contributed a we great deal. We were there deal. more than being in Israel. <laughs> yeah, and it's, so, and it's no downgrading Israel. Exactly. Israel was physically a part of Africa. And we have, because the self-hate has been buried so deep inside, you have to really examine yourself with the Ruach mm. to make sure you're not get, you're not using this because of self-hate. Exactly. So some Evos are now taking on myths like their founding father fell from the sky. Yeah, exactly. That's from the Yoruba. Yeah. You know, they're trying to Afrocentric, make their kind of migration Afrocentric. Because for a long period yeah. of time, there was no documented history externally yeah. on the origins of the Igbo peoples. So now what the liberals are saying yeah. are they're reconstructing a history so they can be identified with Israel based on the Biafran war that occurred yeah. where but, they're saying, hey, the, because of the programs that happened to us here, it's similar to what's going on in Israel. So if Israel can be persecuted and then get a state, after the Biafran war, they wanted the same identity, same recognition as well. And this is where a lot of these Eurocentric scholars are saying this is why they are turning to this Hebrew heritage and trying to recreate this historical lineage because they want to be identified with Israel and receive support from And the from thing Israel. is, um, but this, but Evos have been claiming connection to Israel long before by Afro. Oh, of course. Olu Equiano, who wrote the first documented slave narrative, when he encountered Jews in England, he said, oh, this is what all of our people are doing. We already So doing. we have to know this goes way beyond by Afro because many people will turn to African Americans and say, oh, you're only claiming the Israelites because you were enslaved exactly. like that. And to close, the scripture, yeah. when the when Ezi Eri prayed for me and we opened up the Bible, the scripture that it fell to was Zechariah 10, 6. And it said, I will strengthen Yehuda and save the tribes of Joseph. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. They will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am Yah their Elohim and I will answer them and so we just all broke out in praise and for me this is not just an intellectual journey but this is a spiritual mm -hmm. returning I'm deeply grateful to all the African Hebrew people and families that opened their doors to me their history even family in America that took information from their parents mm -hmm. it's very humbling and I just pray for the day that the two six will, from the diaspora, from the continent, will come together awesome. and we will stand up and we will take what's right. Are we on ours. the same page with that? Can you please tell the people where they can contact yes. you and where they can purchase your book at? Yes, thank you for having me. And you can find me on Prophetic 
worldwind.com and you can and I also have a Facebook and Instagram under prophetic worldwind p r o t h e t i c w h i r l w i n d um I'm on Twitter as well I have a YouTube channel that has a playlist of some of the videos of of my interviews to Hebrews in Africa we have women of the world win which is a, a women's ministry led under mother Angela Malaka Philip shout out to Angela yes, Malaka yes. that's my she sister right there she, she pray people, for man. everybody yeah. even if you don't know she praying <laughs> for you she praying for you uh -huh. and in in Africa they respect their their elder mothers and fathers and we need the elders as well um and the book can be found on Amazon um Kindle and print is prophetic world win uncovering the black biblical destiny published by voices publishing and i appreciate them and just all praises to y'all and family let's just remember that we're not without a home we do have a home we do have a culture we have our own holoka and it's being preserved with our people awesome you have that thank all right you. thank you so much so this is only love all sins like I said, she is a ton of knowledge. Um, she's helping to resurrect the balance in regards to the uh, matrilino and the matriarch elements that's in the text that we tend to, as a patriarchy, overlook, try to suppress, try to oppress. Because for some reason, there's a lot of insecurity that was buried into our men because of how they felt that the woman was elevated over them due to slavery and trauma that occurred over time. And we have really great women in our community that's trying to level out those scales. Like like uh, Michele says, even scales with Yah wants. And in this day and age, this is why we need more of this type of information. So thank you so much for your time, sister. Thank you. And look forward to speaking to you again. Yes, thank All right, you. shalom. Yes.